these are different reports in a way for us because they're not necessarily saying right at the start of the process we've got any of the answers or, or all of, certainly not all of the answers. They're really, each of them is the start of a discussion, um, which is why meetings like yeah, this. This is so. the report. Roger said we're very grateful to IP for their financial support. The background to this, I think crucially, is this ad from Monsanto typifies, and the quote you can see maybe on the side there, but basically uh, a lot of people from the government chief scientist, Monsanto, the US uh, Secretary for Agriculture, the UN Secretary General, pretty much everyone you can think of in the agricultural establishment and lots of other places saying we need to double food production by 2050. And this ad from Monsanto is very explicit about that, to feed uh, a growing world population. <clears throat> and we looked into this because this has really set the framework for discussion about the future of agriculture, this apparent need to double food production. And we think it's not true. It's a lie that we need to double food production. And we produced a report, which is available on our website if anyone's interested, uh, which sets out why it's this debate about the increase in livestock production and the demand for feed, cereals and protein to feed them, is what lies behind a lot of the discussion about the future of farming. We're also looking at the benefits of grass-fed uh, dairy and beef because of the carbon uh, impact. The soil contains huge quantities of carbon, you release it when you plow grass, you release it when you plant temporary lays, you release even more if you plant permanent grass, not a semi-permanent. And although all cattle release in methane, which is what these Irish scientists are measuring, um, nevertheless, that can be offset or mitigated to a significant degree, maybe completely if you take into account not using natural fertilizer in organic systems because of the amount of grass we have now. And the quantity of feed that these free-range non-organic chickens, 250,000 of them, are getting from <coughs> their range is, to put it mildly, pretty restricted. Yeah. Zero, I would think. And the same for these outdoor-reared non-organic pigs. They're not getting much from the range in their finishing period. <coughs> this dependence on imported feed is, is what I said earlier for people like Friends of the Earth causing real controversy because of the destruction of the Amazon rainforest uh, and in particular now maybe more particularly the plowing up of the Cerrado, the permanent rangelands grasslands are disappearing even faster than the rainforest in Brazil is. So at the moment I think it's more or less true although people in this room may want to correct me that virtually no or no soya <laughs> that goes into organic animal feed is coming from areas like this is an answer instead of worrying about how we, as it were, squeeze a diet into the regulation, <coughs> either with allowing amino acids or these exceptions for non-organic uh, uh, elements like fish meal, should we be thinking instead about developing breeds which will survive better on, on what would be a truly organic system. These are long-term questions, but they're important ones, I think. And the final point I want to raise is about the link between animal feed and the quality of the and meat. Now making that on farm. So we are still having to buy in some protein sources. I'm not going to pretend that you know we've got the, the panacea and we're doing it all from, from what's on the farm for the monogastrics, but we are using a huge increase in our own cereal where before that cereal was going off into the barley, it's quite often a mixture of barley, oats, triticale, all sorts of bits and pieces. Um, and 50% of the, of the ration is made up from, from our own cereal. And 50% of that 50%, so 25% if you like, is whole grain. It's all, and the layers, if anything, have, have, have done better, I think, in terms of total egg production. What? what? We're about is a particular process that achieves particular um, ecological benefits, soil uh, fertility benefits, and health benefits. 
So uh, the Soil Association is asking the questions, what can we do about it? Well, really it has to be through the standards. And that, you know, the, the standards are only the first fence. And, you know, people have to be encouraged that they develop their farms beyond it. But unfortunately... Not so many years ago, there was a standard that was about to come into force around about 2012, I believe, for 50% of um, feed requirements for pigs and poultry to come from the holding or a linked holding. And that seems to have slipped off the radar with not an awful lot of consultation or, or discussion. And I was just wondering quite what happened to that. And, and is it maybe time to look at a resurrection of something along those lines? I'm not sure if that was a workable standard, but certainly it had all the makings of being heading in the right direction and, and, and using the standards process to, to manoeuvre people into that direction. One of the things we're interested in the conversation today is to see what's the role of standards and what needs to go with standards. If, st if standards is, has a part to play, what else do we need to do to make sure those standards There's been an element of goalposts moving not just now, it's happened for a number of years in terms of standards and so on, and I don't know quite how you, you know, whether it is the carrot or the stick. Somehow we've got to have a combination of the two that actually <laughs> says, look, you can do this, and it's whether you aspire to do it or whether you do it because you're forced. And, and I don't know what the, you know, how you get that balance. As I say, for us, we've already made that step because that's what, you know, as a farm we're trying to do. You know, and unless the Soil Association actually take the plunge and say, we are going to do this ourselves, I don't think uh, anything very really radical will change. One of the things we're doing is working, trying to work, much more closely with standard setters in other EU countries who are aiming, have the same sort of philosophical approach that we do, to aim higher than the EU regulations. So I'm not saying that's an answer, but it, I mean, this is the sort of issue where we'd want to talk to some of the key certifiers like Crowd and Sweden, Beerland and Germany, to see if we can raise the standard at least amongst a group of certifiers in the EU without trying to start by changing the regulation or move everything. And in developing the market, there is a way here that producers uh, the, the uh, processors and the marketeers have got to come together to develop the system that is appropriate to the ecologically limited system which is organic agriculture. And One of the comments we've had on the report already from a supermarket uh, committed to organic, not, uh, uh, that they've raised the concern that if we go down some of the routes we've you know, sketched out, we're still going to do this, that we'll make egg production for supermarket sales and poultry generally. But surely a long time ago, a very long time ago, <laughs> they would have said the same about organic itself, wouldn't they? The, the, the major outlets would have said, why would we try to sell organic? It's more expensive. Uh, why would people buy it? and it was all about reaching the consumer and, and telling them about it. It's a multi-issue topic, so it's difficult to engage with the public. I mean, we've tried all sorts of things. We've sponsored DVDs on bird flu, swine flu, you know, helped films like um, uh, Pig Business, things like that, you know. But, but, but this is another issue, again, for people to take on board. Um, it, is there a way that you've thought of yet of, of engaging with customers who might then help to push this kind of issue. We might take us on to the second one as well, around, <laughs> around grass-fed, where there's been this kind of issue of, you know, it's become quite an, an issue with consumers in the States, it's kind of, does that help or does that hinder? I mean, I guess from an organic point of view, we're resistant to anything that kind of doesn't talk about more holistic systems. And, and, and actually just, it's almost why we're even having a discussion about whether we feed grains or concentrates to beef and, and sheep. And sheep. It just, you know, I, I took a, a tour round last week and uh, these were you know, sheep farmers, conventional sheep farmers, and they asked me, they said, oh, what, what do you supplement your twin bearing ewes with? Because I noticed that in the report and I was just outraged that it was even in there, frankly. Um, and I said, grass. 
And they said, well, well what, about, what, what about the triplets? More grass. They get a bit more. You know, it, it's that simple. Get your breeds right, get your stocking right. We just should even be having that discussion about those. It would be great just for people to, to prioritise, you know, actually from all of the things we've heard today and, and maybe other things, just in taking this work forward. You know, it can be a challenge to us or it could be a challenge to the market or it could be a challenge to, for us to celebrate good practice. But you know, what do you think is the one thing that actually, in order to take, to, uh, to give this some room? Uh, I think I'd like to see soya drop from really in rations because I think we can do now, but I think that's the big issue. And I think we should be more focused on the energy crops like green sugar beet. I think that's an excellent point. I mean, when I do formulations, energy is the biggest shortage. Never protein. It's not an issue, but energy is really important, so I think I'd like to see that. Combination of some brief study, but a bit more uh, research on the polygastrics of the range, and then the, the getting out of farms seems to be a good Brilliant. Well, thank you. We're a little bit over, but a uh, good discussion. Um, thank you, particular to, to Ed and to John mm -hmm. for kickstarting a great conversation, and thanks again to Ian and Ivy. And can I just say that the end report is very good. Right, there is a...